If you're born after 1975 in America, you probably know someone who has gone robo-tripping. At least for me, I had asthma growing up, and a lot of times I was given over-the-counter cough medicine for when I had asthma attacks. I was coughing to be able to breathe enough, so taking Robitussin to suppress that cough? Well, you probably didn't need to do that. But what you also don't need to do is chug a whole bottle of Robitussin to go robo-tripping. I bring up 1975 because throughout the 1990s, you can start to see more and more literature talk about misuse of something called dextromethorphan, which is the active ingredient in Robitussin. This is what suppresses cough, and it can also send you on a trip. As much as we've known people who have misused dextromethorphan, at least in my case, I've hardly ever known anyone who enjoyed it. Even taking it for coughs, the syrup doesn't taste good. People may have robo-tripped once and then never do it again. And also, keep in mind, I'm only mentioning the voluntary ingestions, on the much darker side of things. The overdose can happen involuntarily, and in the emergency room, that part of the history needs to be collected from visual cues on behalf of EMS. So if you go a little bit deeper, you can find more similarities between over-the-counter and prescription cough syrups than what initially comes to mind. We know that dextromethorphan comes as a syrup. Some people, they're not supposed to do this, but they buy it as a powder. So in both of these cases, you can take it by mouth. Oral administration means that most of the dose that's swallowed is metabolized by the liver first. And this is good because the active form of dextromethorphan is dextrorphan. Usually, these moieties on the sides will get acted on first in metabolism. And this brings us to the first similarity between over-the-counter and prescription cough syrups. Prescription cough syrup is codeine-based. It also usually has promethazine in it, but people are misusing it for the codeine because codeine is an opioid. Promethazine isn't. In the poppy sap, where we get morphine, codeine is in there too. They're both naturally occurring. Morphine is kind of like dextromethorphan in that to get them in the body, you can consume something that gets broken down to them. Codeine is broken down in the liver to morphine, and dextromethorphan is broken down to dextrorphan. This makes codeine and dextromethorphan something that we call prodrugs. Pro from Greek meaning before. Not only are they both prodrugs, but they're also broken down by the same enzyme in the liver, cytochrome P450 2D6. I brought this up during my prescription cough syrup video, link in the description below, that some people could drink a large amount of promethazine codeine syrup and feel absolutely nothing. And the reason for that is that their genetics show that they have a 2D6 deficiency. And what does that mean? Well, if they don't have a lot of liver enzyme that breaks codeine to morphine, then codeine doesn't become morphine, so it never becomes activated. Theoretically, the same thing would happen with Robitussin in these people, it never gets activated. You gotta be careful with what you see sometimes in literature because the concept might trip some people up. A poor metabolizer would be someone who doesn't turn the syrup into active drug, meaning that they could drink a lot of it and still feel little effect. So poor metabolizer is high tolerance. An extensive metabolizer we usually denote as a positive quality, given that when something is extensive, we usually associate it with something that's thorough and therefore high quality. But in this case, an extensive metabolizer means that they can convert large quantities of the syrup into active drug. So they technically would have a low tolerance because of a high percentage of what they consume becomes active. Low dose, high effect, which you don't want in this case, because the intended use of these is to suppress cough, not to dissociate from reality. To keep going on the opioid analogy, dextromethorphan happens to be related to codeine. If you take the mirror image of dextrorphan, you get levorphanol. The orientation is built into the names of these. Dextro means right and levo means left. If you look at symmetry in nature, just take for example the right and the left hand, you'll notice that you can reflect them off a surface, but when you superimpose them on top of each other, there's no physical way to get their shapes to be exactly the same. That observing the hands facing the same direction, there's a median that's the same, but for example the thumb is on the opposite side. You could try to get the fingers to match, but that means that the hands are then facing different directions. When you apply this to chemicals, the chemical formulas are the same, but these stereoisomers are different in orientation. The reason why this is important is because in order for the pain-relieving opioid activity to happen at the opioid receptor, the molecule needs to be in the L orientation. And the potency of the analgesia is correlated to how strongly it binds into the receptor. 
It's like putting a handprint in something soft. You'll notice that the other hand kind of fits, but not really all the way. And if it's an imprint in some kind of hard material, you can't really fit it in at all, which is analogous to what's going on in the case of dextromethorphan because over-the-counter cough syrup doesn't do anything for pain like morphine does. It doesn't fit into the opioid receptor site to produce analgesia because it's flipped. So when you do a basic search for dextromethorphan, you'll see that it's a non-opioid. And that should make sense. An opioid refers to all substances with morphine-like properties. Without that analgesia, Robitussin is a non-opioid. And the word opiate refers to any agent derived from opium, which dextromethorphan isn't. An opium refers to dried powdered mixture of 20 different alkaloids, which include morphine and codeine from the unripe seed capsules of the poppy. Also keep in mind, with the metabolism, the half-life in the body sometimes can change. If someone is a poor metabolizer, the half-life is longer by around 10 times, 30 hours compared to three hours in rapid metabolizers. And the metabolites are excreted by the kidneys, meaning that if someone is doing this and they have kidney dysfunction or kidney failure or chronic kidney disease, well, that overdose can last a really long time. So we already know what codeine syrup does. What happens when the over-the-counter stuff is misused? This brings us back to the chemical structure. We have an alkylated amine that's adjacent to a cyclohexane ring. Ketamine has this. Phencyclidine, something known as PCP, also has this too. Actually, sometimes in urine drug screens, dextromethorphan will be mistaken for a positive on PCP because that's how the assay picks it up. We know that both of these can be dissociative agents, so this could explain why that feeling happens when someone robodoses, but for dextromethorphan, it doesn't just stop here. This is a little less intuitive, and if you look through literature in the 90s, it seemed like no one really knew how or why this was happening. But DXM also has serotonergic activity at the 5-HT2 receptor. And this happens at normal doses, which is why you see the warnings on the label about combining it with other medicines. Combinations make this worse because of drug-drug interaction. The patient that was described in the Chubby Emu video reported that she was self-medicating her depression with DXM. Dextromethorphan actually floods the brain with serotonin. The flooding of serotonin causes this euphoria, makes people feel better, um, getting them out of that depression for that momentary period of time. Unfortunately, that is followed by crash where the serotonin levels are not sustained, and that unfortunately can lead to, to greater um, depression. But the initial euphoric feeling, that antidepressant kind of feeling, is due to that flood of serotonin. So all of this could make sense, boosting serotonergic activity to help with treatment of depression, but here's the thing. SSRIs are a first-line treatment in depression, barring any contraindications. There is some ongoing research in studying DXM in treatment-resistant depression. That is, at least on the study, someone eligible for the study would have tried less than three different types of medicine for major depressive disorder. But take caution on the hype because it could be a stretch for something like this to unseat the current first-line therapy. Even if there's good evidence, there's still adoption that needs to happen. And for something like DXM, I'm not 100% sure if that's going to happen. When someone misuses something like dextromethorphan, they're taking huge amounts of it. And if it acts on the serotonin receptor, then in the setting of overdose and in combination with something else, it's likely creating an inappropriate overexcitation, which can and will be worsened when combined with other agents. This is something called serotonin syndrome, which is a serotonin toxicity. Serotonin syndrome is basically a conglomeration of signs and symptoms that occur um, in an individual that's been exposed or has consumed too much serotonin, either by combining medications or um, combining treatments that they shouldn't be combining. There's certainly neurocognitive effects that can come as part of serotonin syndrome, anxiety, irritability, agitation, confusion, delirium, dissociation even. There can be autonomic effects on the body where we see high blood pressure, high heart rates, increased temperature. Some other symptoms include shakiness or tremors, a jumpiness um, with these individuals. And, and so serotonin syndrome, there is no blood test, there is no imaging study to diagnose serotonin syndrome. The diagnosis is based on a 
purely clinical evaluation. If in the emergency room doctors know for sure of an inappropriate ingestion, then usually checking the ankles to find bilateral ankle clonus and hyperreflexia in the lower extremities can give a good idea of serotonin toxicity. There's also been a push for greater recognition for serotonergic agents together that could potentially cause serotonin toxicity. As I described in the Chubby Emu video with ondansetron usage, Generally, if someone is known to be on SSRI, or in this case was thought to have been adherent to her medicines, I think, or at least I hope, most would opt for a non-serotonin antagonist antiemetic. So we can say with confidence, don't chug a whole bottle of dextromethorphan, and especially don't mix it with other things because of what it can do in the brain with serotonin. But when we say don't mix it with other things, sometimes it already comes mixed in. You see, with the over-the-counter stuff, there's often other medicines in there. In some cases, it's Tylenol, which will damage your liver in the setting of overdose. Sometimes it's guafenicin, which is another cough medicine, although any effects that it might have in overdose seem to be overshadowed by the DXM. Other times, DXM is also combined with anti-allergy medicines. Almost all of these in the over-the-counter formulations are like Benadryl first-generation antihistamine. Knowing that that class of antihistamine causes anticholinergic effects, even in regular doses, in the setting of overdose, it might be harder to pick that out, that someone had misused dextromethorphan because you get the same tachycardia, diaphoresis, and hypertension. But more recently, there's also hydrobromide that's in the cough syrup. You see this as HBR, that's with the dextromethorphan, that's used to make the salt. There was a case report recently that was published that talked about bromism. So typically you think of younger people like middle and high school age misusing OTC cough syrup, but this was a 47 year old woman in this particular case report. So if you take too much DXM hydrobromide, then you can expect to have too much bromide in your body. Look at the periodic table. Bromine is in the same group as chlorine. Chloride is accounted for in the anion gap as a minor anion in the body. And interestingly, bromism can present with a negative anion gap because of increased negative charge. Or you can also get hyperchloremic non-gap acidosis. But there shouldn't be any reason that chloride is high in the blood, right? And the reason is right, because the lab assay gets interference from bromide to falsely elevate the level. Bromide has a long half-life in the body, 12 days. And so someone who chronically misuses DXM HBR syrup can have it accumulate in their organs over time. This can cause fatigue, headache, and memory loss. And there's also skin reactions that happen with bromism, like acne, and those have also been well documented too. So the last questions that I see from people are about dependency, addiction, and potential permanent damage from misusing DXM. Regarding the dependency, it appears yes, some people, although it might be rare, can develop a dependency on misusing dextromethorphan. Dextromethorphan certainly can um, cause a dependency. Um, it may not be a physical dependency, but there is a cognitive dependency that can come with dextromethorphan use, especially chronic use. What happens in the brain is when the brain is flooded with a certain amount of serotonin, it can get used to having that amount available to feel good. And when that is over time reduced or taken away, the effects can be really detrimental to the person where they can feel a depression that's even worse than the depression they started with. And over time, they can develop a tolerance to where the same amount of dextromethorphan use doesn't produce the same flood of serotonin. So the dependency comes from chasing that initial effect that people get with illicit drug use um, or dextromethorphan use. The first few times of using dextromethorphan in, in an abusive way, the effects can be really wonderful, really high. Individuals will often try to recreate that initial high by continuing use over and over, and will find that they can't achieve that, unfortunately. And with the serotonin syndrome and even the NMDA receptor with dextromethorphan, it's possible that excitotoxicity can happen in the brain leading to some cell death resulting in permanent damage. This has been not only documented in literature, but also observed in rare cases too. Dextromethorphan misuse can lead to permanent uh, damage in the brain. Um, when there is a flood of serotonin, um, basically the brain cells are on overdrive. 
And the euphoric feeling that people feel is caused by that flood of serotonin initially. But what's actually happening during that period, even though you feel good, is your brain cells are actually killing themselves. Um, and there is a neurotoxicity that can happen from that. And so with chronic misuse of dextromethorphan, we can see permanent damages to the brain. Um, we can see problems with learning and memory. And um, we have even seen cases of psychosis um, occur with individuals that, that misuse dextromethorphan. In the long term, it certainly can lead to dementias. There are some very serious neurocognitive effects that are permanent that can occur with dextromethorphan misuse. And that's a brief overview of dextromethorphan misuse. Mixing it with other serotonergic agents can cause serotonergic toxicity that can be hard to identify if a history can't be collected. And in many times, these patients may not want to tell you on a voluntary ingestion. And at other times, the ingestion may not have been voluntary. Whatever the case, misuse of Robitussin, Delsim, Corocidin, whatever the brand name is, it's dextromethorphan. It's used for coughs, and it's not to be taken at doses beyond what's on the label. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourself, and be well.